and good afternoon from bustling midtown Manhattan. You join me outside Pennsylvania Station, or New York Penn Station as it's more commonly referred to. Now, I'm very excited to be here today, as I'll be taking Amtrak's Lakeshore Limited service through to Chicago. This is one of their famous long distance trains, and I've booked a roomette for tonight's trip. But before all that, New York Penn has been given a bit of a makeover since I last took an Amtrak train. So first, let's check out the new Moynihan Train Hall. First impressions are, wow, what a difference this is from the old, dingy part of the station that used to be the home of Amtrak. Moynihan Train Hall only opened about a year ago, on New Year's Day 2021. It's all housed within the James A. Farley Building, which was originally a US Postal Service facility. Despite only becoming fully operational last year, plans to convert this to be part of Penn Station were first conceived back in the early 1990s, with the renovation works being completed at a cost of $1.6 billion. Between the 9th Avenue and 31st Street exits, you'll find the Amtrak ticket office. Amtrak also offer a checked luggage service to select destinations on most of their long distance trains, including Chicago, and this is also where you check your luggage in. All passengers may check in two bags for free, regardless of their class of travel. You'll also find a few shops and cafes scattered in various parts of the concourse. However, we shan't be needing these today as all sleeping car passengers get access to Amtrak's Metropolitan Lounge. Simply show your ticket to whoever's on reception and they'll grant you access. Now, I think to emphasise just how amazed I was with this lounge, first I need to quickly show you a shot of the old and lifeless Club Cellar lounge that used to be offered here at Penn Station. Okay, here goes. Now, I would say wow, but that would be a massive understatement. This is a night and day difference from the old lounge. It's bright, open and stylish, with more than enough seats to go around. A counter service with complimentary drinks and snacks is offered, as well as a paid bar service with a fairly wide range of alcoholic drinks on offer. This lounge even has a small business centre, and there are even luggage lockers offered, should you wish to go off and explore New York without your bags before you catch a train. And to top it off, the staff working here in the lounge were amazing and very attentive, I'm going to go ahead and say that this is easily the best railway lounge I've ever visited. Nothing else even comes close to this for me. Now, if you ever find yourself in this lounge, I can't recommend enough the Santa Fe chicken sandwich. It was divine, and is even served hot. If you head out onto the terrace, you'll get some excellent views of the concourse below. Eventually, it's time to leave the tranquility of the lounge and head downstairs to board our train. All Amtrak trains are announced in the lounge. Our train will be departing from track 6 today, which is rather convenient as it's located right next to the entrance to the lounge. As I touched on at the start of the video, we'll be catching train number 49, the Lakeshore Limited, which will be taking all the way to its final destination of Chicago. Usually, this service will depart Penn Station daily at 3.40pm, however this had temporarily been reduced to 5 days per week at the time of filming as a result of staff shortages due to COVID. Hey guys, um, this is 49, so we have a situation with our escalator. 
So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be walking down the escalator to get there was then a problem with the escalator, and rather comically, it took them around 10 minutes to come up with the ingenious idea of getting us to walk down it. Lifts are also provided should you need them, and I can assure you that these actually worked. And here's what will be taking us through to Chicago tonight, or at least partly. You see, the train that starts in New York is only one portion of the Lakeshore Limited. We'll join up with another portion of the train from Boston a few hours after departure in Albany. Now, I appreciate that the grim platforms here at Penn Station don't really allow me to properly show you the rolling stock that features on today's train, so we'll have a better look at these in a bit. But for now, let's go and find our roomette. The sleeping cars used on this route are the single-decker Viewliner cars, as opposed to the famous double-decker superliner coaches that are more common out west. This is due to a much tighter loading gauge on the eastern routes. Namely, the superliners are too tall for the platforms here at Penn Station. Now, sleeping car passengers are automatically allocated a car and room number at booking. So simply find the car printed on your ticket, show it to the attendant who will be waiting by the entry door, and they'll grant you access. I've lucked out as the coach we're in today is one of the new Viewliner 2s. These were built by the American branch of the Spanish manufacturer CAF, and this particular example is practically brand new, having only entered service last year in 2021. And here's our home for the next 19 hours or so, in the form of this cosy little roomette. Now, before we set off, let's just take a quick look at our route for today. Our journey will see us covering 959 miles, or 1,543 kilometres, as we initially head north through upstate New York to Albany, before heading west, briefly crossing into Pennsylvania, followed by crossing both Ohio and Indiana, before finally arriving into Chicago, Illinois. Scheduled travel time is 19 hours and 32 minutes, and will very briefly hit a top speed in the region of 110 miles an hour, or 177 kilometers an hour. And we depart New York on time at 20 to 4. As is always the case with Penn Station, the first portion of the trip mainly sees us travelling in tunnels, as we make our way out of Manhattan. Out of the tunnels and we find ourselves heading north on the eastern bank of the Hudson, which will follow for around 130 miles to Albany. At Crotton Harmon, we pass a rather large depot for Metro North Railroad, whose services we run alongside for the time being. I must say, the scenery as we make our way up the Hudson is really rather pleasant. There are plenty of lovely river views with a backdrop of rolling hills on offer here.
Soon, 5.30 rolls around, meaning it's dinner time. This service features Amtrak's flexible dining, as opposed to the traditional dining found on a lot of the trains west of Chicago. So it's up to you as to whether you eat in the dining car, or just have your meals delivered to your room. Anyway, on the way to the dining car, we pass through the other sleeping car, which is an older Viewliner 1 coach, which dates from the mid-1990s. For a look at this type of coach, be sure to check out my review of the longer route between New York and Chicago, the Cardinal, which you'll find in the top right corner of the screen now. Although, be warned, it is an older video, so perhaps view at your own risk. Anyway, this is the dining car, and I don't know about you, but... I think it looks very classy indeed. It's another Viewliner coach, and I think the fact that they've maintained the double windows in here really adds to the overall look. Dinner is served in this sort of pre-packaged setup. All meals are served with as many soft drinks as you like, plus one alcoholic drink. For sleeping car passengers, Meals are included in the price of your ticket. It's currently not possible for coach passengers to eat in the dining car, but there was a cafe car attached in Albany for them. For my dinner, I went for the enchiladas, while my better half opted for the slow braised beef. Trust me, it all tasted quite a bit better than it looks. All meals are served with a side salad and warm bread, as well as the choice of brownie or blondie for dessert. With dinner out of the way, I think it's time for a room tour. The roomettes are set out in a 1 plus 1 configuration across the aisle. Each roomette can accommodate up to two people, with two seats facing each other when in daytime mode. The sliding doors can be locked from the inside, but not from the outside. A pair of privacy curtains are provided, although why they didn't just make the door completely opaque, I'll never know. By the door, you'll find switches for the main light, as well as a little night light. I found the seats to be nice, wide, and, most importantly for such a long journey, comfortable. There's a bar under the seat which you can pull on to recline it a little. The pedal is used for setting up the lower bed. In the panel above each seat, you'll find a reading light, as well as what Amtrak calls an area light. There's also an attendant call button, and an on-off switch for the PA speaker in the room. One of the seats also has this car style air vent, although I think it's more intended to be used when the beds are set up. Each seat also has access to not one, but two plug sockets. Above this, you'll find a thermostat, as well as duplicated controls for the main lights. Each roomette also has access to a bin. There are more air vents by the window. Each seat has a nice deep cup holder for your drinks. In between the seats is a fold-out table. I'd say they're large enough for two people to dine off of, and unlike every other version of Amtrak's roomettes, they're actually pretty sturdy. Curtains are also provided for the main windows. Over here, you'll find steps up to the upper berth. Unlike on the Viewliner ones, there isn't a toilet hidden under here. There's also a mirror over here, which of course has its own light. While there is no toilet in the room, the fold-out sink that you'll find on the older coaches still features here.
Space for storing your bags can be found in this little cubby hole. The upper berth can be pulled down fairly easily by turning this handle and pulling. Now, the upper berth is every bit as well equipped as the lower berth, with access to its own windows and curtains, reading lights, air vents and storage. The only thing that's really missing up here is an additional plug socket, but hey, first world problems. And lastly, as for how much space you'll have, well, if travelling alone, there's more than enough room, but they are a little on the cramped side if there are two of you. But overall, I'm a pretty big fan of these roomettes, but do let me know your thoughts on them in the comments below. Darkness slowly creeps up on us as we close in on Albany. About two and a half hours after departing New York, we arrive at Albany Rensselaer, which, as I mentioned earlier, is where we'll join up with the Boston portion of the train. This is also the first smoke stop or fresh air stop of the trip, affording us the opportunity to step off the train for a breath of fresh air and a cigarette if you wish. Our coach is right at the back of the train, with the only coach behind us being the baggage car. There's plenty going on here in Albany, with other trains serving the station including Empire services to Niagara Falls, the Ethan Allen Express to Rutland, as well as the International Maple Leaf and Adirondack services to Toronto and Montreal respectively. So, a better look at the consist. These two General Electric Genesis P42 DCs will be taking us the rest of the way to Chicago. Here's a look at another Viewliner 1 car. From the outside, they look pretty much identical to the newer Viewliner 2s. Next is an Amfleet 1 half business class, half cafe car. These were built between 1975 and 1977. Behind this are a pair of Amfleet 2 coach class cars dating from the early 1980s. All of these coaches originated in Boston and will now be attached to our train. While we wait for the attachment, here's a better look at those P42 diesel electric locomotives. Built between 1992 and 2001, they currently make up the bulk of Amtrak's non-electrified fleet. However, they are set to be replaced by brand new Siemens Charger locomotives over the coming years. Now, I appreciate that the lighting here isn't great at all, but this is one of the coach cars. The seating here is actually pretty spacious, being laid out in a 2 plus 2 configuration. I have a review of Amtrak's long distance coach coming up, so why not subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss that. With station work now complete, we begin heading west towards Chicago. With it now being too dark to see much, we get the attendant to set up our beds and decide to turn in for the night. 
The lower berth is made up of fully reclining the two seats. Now of course, bedding is provided and you know what, it's a pretty good quality in my opinion. As I showed you earlier, the upper berth is pulled down from the ceiling. A safety net is provided so you shouldn't need to worry about taking a tumble in the night. The only thing I will say about the upper berth is that the mattress is a bit on the hard side, especially when compared to the lower berth. After a good night's sleep, I decide to head and check out the rest of the coach. Here's what you can expect from one of the full sized bedrooms. This is actually the accessible bedroom. The other bedrooms are very similar, although they also feature ensuite toilet and showering facilities. At the end of where the roomettes are, you'll find coffee and bottles of water. Then moving further back, we find the coach's 28 roomettes. As I touched on in my room tour, unlike the older Viewliner coaches, the Viewliner 2s don't have toilets in the roomettes, but rather there are a pair of communal toilets at the far end of the coach. And I found that these were kept fairly clean and well stocked at all points of the journey. Roomette passengers also have access to communal showering facilities. Towels are provided so you don't need to worry about bringing your own. Now, the only other calf sleeping cars I've experienced in the past were the new Mark V coaches on the Caledonian sleeper and, in keeping with their Scottish counterparts, the shower's hot water on these coaches didn't work, which certainly isn't great. Those of you who also have experience with these coaches, is this a common occurrence or have I just got unlucky? Be sure to let me know in the comments. Lastly, complimentary Wi-Fi is offered throughout the train and, while hardly the fastest, it's not bad and I was certainly expecting much worse. Anyway, we're now just pulling into our next station stop of Toledo, Ohio, and to my utter amazement, we're actually only running a little bit late at this point. For those of you not familiar with Amtrak's long distance trains, it's not uncommon for them to run several hours late due to a whole host of reasons. Soon after Toledo, the sun begins to rise as we cruise west towards Indiana and Illinois. It's soon time to head to the dining car to grab some breakfast. I went for the omelette which was okay, accompanied by these rather nice chicken sausages and these rather horrible potatoes, while well, my girlfriend went for the railroad french toast accompanied by some syrup, which I'm told was delicious. After breakfast, all that's left to do is sit back and relax for the last few hours as the Midwest rolls on by. Almost all of the trip is spent sharing tracks with a vast array of freight trains. In contrast to its passenger network, America's rail freight network is one of the best in the world, with the US moving more cargo by rail than any other country. With a few exceptions, namely on the Northeast Corridor between Boston and Washington DC, freight companies own most of the track in the US, 
with Amtrak paying them to use it. That said though, federal law still requires freight companies to give priority to passenger trains, in theory at least. At Elkhart, Indiana, we pull up alongside the National New York Central Railroad Museum. The New York Central Railroad was founded in 1853, although they ceased operations in 1968, before their passenger services briefly merged with the Pennsylvania Railroad to form Penn Central. They then went bankrupt a short time later in 1970, and it was actually this that finally got then-President Richard Nixon to sign the Rail Passenger Service Act, forming Amtrak and saving many of the country's historic rail routes, including the Lakeshore Limited. Around 25 minutes later, we arrive at our final intermediate stop of South Bend. From South Bend, it's just one hour until Chicago. It's not long before we find ourselves alongside electrified metro commuter lines as we close in on the outskirts of Chicago. Overall, I've had a fantastic time travelling over from New York. Besides the cold shower, these new Viewliner 2 coaches are fantastic in my opinion, and a nice change from the old and worn out coaches that I'm used to on Amtrak. As for the cost, well, we were travelling on a ticket from New York all the way through to Emeryville in the San Francisco Bay Area, which cost $1,219 for two people. However, a roomette on just the Lakeshore Limited will set you back anywhere between just under $400 and over $700 for one person, which, needless to say, is rather expensive. If two of you are travelling together in a roomette, then it seems to be a flat $144 extra. Now, I know you could fly between New York and Chicago in a fraction of the time and at a fraction of the cost, However, when travelling with Amtrak, I think you're more paying for the experience rather than a convenient way of travelling from A to B, and the fares do seem to be at least a little better value for money if you're travelling on a connecting train, as we were. So overall, a good but rather expensive experience, but what did you make of it all? Be sure to let me know in the comments below. We end up running alongside I-90 for a few miles as we make our way towards Union Station. No trains are faster than cars jibe from me today, as the traffic on the interstate generally went speeding on past us, but not to worry as I'm in no rush. We end up pulling into Chicago's Union Station around half an hour late at 20 past 10, which trust me, by Amtrak standards is practically on time. I'm now off to have a mooch around the station before catching the famous California Zephyr to Emeryville later on in the day. Expect that review in a couple of months. But in the meantime, I do hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, be sure to help us out by giving it a like. If you're new to the channel, then be sure to subscribe and enable notifications as I publish new trip reports every Monday and Friday. Thanks a lot for watching and I'll see you on Friday.